you very much for the opportunity uh, to be part of this KES series um, and to contribute to the discussions that are going to promote debate and understanding of older people and their care. And in the context of this seminar, um, the context uh, of which is about palliative and, and end-of-life care and looking at the role of the hospice volunteer uh, in community settings. Just at the start, I'd like to acknowledge an absent colleague, an absent colleague who's very present, if you get the irony, Carol Kimoramy, who, due to a period of, of, of ill health, can't, can't be with us. She's one of the uh, Open University colleagues. Carol, along with Anya and George, had the vision for this work, and so her influence, even though she's not here, is writ large throughout. So I just wanted to acknowledge Carol's influence uh, at the start. So, over the course of the next 20 minutes, um, we're going to set the regional and strategic context of policy concerning end-of-life care and, uh, and the role of the volunteer, and then present the findings from a literature review um, we commissioned and highlight the benefits to, the, to three stakeholder groups, the hospice, service users and carers, and to volunteers themselves. And then George is going to pull together our thoughts, identify some of the gaps in the literature, or the, or the evidence base, perhaps more accurately, and make some suggestions for next steps. So, in terms of national context, um, over recent years, policy across the five nations has addressed palliative and end-of-life care, um, and Assumpta's very poignantly already identified the, the demographics and the reasons for why palliative care and end-of-life care is increasing in priority, increasing number of older people, increasing number of people with long-term conditions, etc. Variable experiences of end-of-life care as well. And all of these policies recognise the need to deliver palliative and end-of-life care closer to home. So service users have got a preference uh, about the location of end-of-life care. And yet, some of the statistics, the evidence indicates that while 74% of people would prefer to die at home, only 54%, uh, sorry, 54% still die in hospital. So despite end-of-life care strategies being in place, these preferences to die at home are still not being met. Policies also recognise that the voluntary sector, including hospices, are key in making these aspirations a reality. So that's a little bit about the, the national contexts. So with respect to the regional context in Northern Ireland, a number of key documents have informed and shaped palliative and end-of-life care strategies. In Living Matters, Dying Matters, Michael McGimpsby stated, I am mindful that families, carers and volunteers continue to be the crucial cornerstone of this care. He also went on to say that there needed to be a robust infrastructure to bring patients, families and carers alongside public, independent, community and voluntary sectors to enable all organisations to work collaboratively to design, deliver and improve palliative and end-of-life care services. Transforming Your Care highlighted the need for integrated services at local level, the provision of more community-based services and care for people at home, including end-of-life care. It also acknowledged that all uh, that these policies also um, it also acknowledge rather that these services will regard home as the hub, and I think that's really important. Home will be regarded as the hub. So these Northern Ireland-based policies align with those in England, Scotland, Wales, and and Ireland, and all recognise the need for care to be brought closer to home. They also acknowledge the role of the voluntary sector, including hospices, as key partners in achieving this. So, hospice-enabled death that meets an individual's end-of-life needs is needed in a range of settings, including the hospice itself, but also home, and, and also elsewhere. Sometimes we, we forget that uh, end-of-life care and palliative care is delivered in places like prisons too. And volunteers make a significant contribution to this. There's a wide variety of hospice volunteer roles, 
and volunteers are essential to the effective service delivery. And in fact, some of the literature uh, indicates that hospices wouldn't be able to undertake all that they do without the role of volunteers. And, and in a moment, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about the, the range of roles that volunteers undertake. And as hospice provision increases in scope and size, so the, the demand for increased voluntary support will be needed as well. And wherever this care is provided, it's going to require collaboration between hospice at home staff, volunteers and other community staff to enable home to be the primary place for palliative and end-of-life care for those that want it. So hospice at home staff, volunteers and other community staff will need to work together in a complementary way. So, new models of health emphasise community response will be reliant on volunteer involvement. And currently, whilst there are low, members, uh, low numbers rather, of volunteers providing direct care, there is some indication, NICE for example, indicating that this needs to be expanded. So all of this in the specific context of palliative and end-of-life care is further underscored by some of the broader strategies concerning volunteering more generally. So for example, the volunteering strategy for Northern Ireland identifies the need for a strategic approach to the promotion and expansion of volunteering in Northern Ireland and to provide the conditions that will, quote, enable volunteering to flourish and to ensure that its impact on life in Northern Ireland is maximised. So, recognising the increasing importance of the role of volunteers in palliative and end-of-life care settings, uh, we worked together uh, and commissioned a literature review to scope this whole area. And here's a, a, just a, a few um, examples of the brief that were given to the person who did the literature review. So, to look at the, the nature of volunteer roles, to scope them, to look at things to do with selection, induction and training of volunteers, and to outline the benefits. So... What I'm just going to do briefly now is to highlight from this literature the benefits to those three stakeholder groups that I mentioned earlier, the, the hospice itself, service users and carers, and finally to volunteers themselves. Um, and some of you might be able to recognise some of the pictures here as well of, of, of local hospices. So volunteers are involved in a wide range of volunteer activity housekeeping, shopping, transport, gardening, uh, but only a few, as we already intimated earlier, are actually involved in direct care delivery. They provide a range of benefits, driven by a desire to improve quality, and that's really important. The drive to improve quality, not looking just at this as, as a matter of cost reduction. There's some evidence, and I'll mention it again in a moment, that... Um, the quality of care is increased and cost, effectively, um, cost effectiveness is, is, is reduced. But if cost saving is the primary motivating factor, it's unlikely that volunteering activity will succeed. So it's got to be driven by a desire to improve quality. Volunteers bring diversity to a professional team, but shouldn't substitute professional roles. They also provide strong reciprocal links to the community, acting as bridges between hospice and community, and helping the hospice to be responsive, more responsive to local community needs. They bring great benefits, but supporting volunteers isn't cost neutral. Careful recruitment, selection, induction, education and training and ongoing support is needed, and also how they are managed, that's really crucially important. And then interesting to note this concept of uh, the volunteer value, and this is defined as the cost a hospice would incur if it employed staff to undertake the work done by volunteers. And a, and a pilot study, I think it was done in 2006, 2007, by Help the Hospices, suggested that for every pound spent on supporting volunteers, hospices received a return of more than £11 for that investment. So that's a little bit about the evidence base in terms of benefits to hospice. So what about the benefits to service users and their carers or families? I've already noted that there's some evidence that volunteers enhance quality care. 
They're also able to provide support across the illness trajectory, from the beginning through to supporting people as they're dying and then to supporting families beyond and into bereavement. A systematic review of hospice at home care found that, increased, that there was increased patient carer satisfaction and that was, that was consistently reported. Support by volunteers was considered to be different and complementary to professional care and it includes a wide range of different sorts of support, emotional, practical, informational and spiritual. And there is some evidence that hospice at home care, voluntary help, improves quality and responsiveness of end of life care and access to that care and that the support that's given to the person as they are dying in their own home is enhanced. So finally, what about the benefits to volunteers themselves? This has been a um, of, the, of the sort of the, the three stakeholder groups. This is probably the group that has been most researched. So it's been well, well researched and findings suggest a range of benefits to the volunteers themselves. Health and social benefits, for example, and personal growth of volunteers, including increased self-esteem, increased well-being, increased self-worth, etc. Volunteers get a great sense of satisfaction from doing this kind of work. They also report really valuing the education and training that's offered as part of the role. And all these benefits that volunteers report are linked to the motivations for volunteering. And the literature identifies quite a wide range of, of uh, motivations for volunteering, including things like um, having their own personal experience of caring for somebody who's required end-of-life care or palliative care, a desire to help, a desire to know and find out more about palliative and end-of-life care, wanting to give something back. So those are something about the motivations for volunteering. There seems to be, therefore, an enduring appeal concerned with volunteering, and there's no problem recruiting volunteers to working in hospices. But I think it's important also to, to highlight that there are some challenges associated with volunteering. And some of the ones that the literature review uh, identified were things like poor communication between the hospice um, and, and the volunteers themselves, lack of emotional support given to the volunteers, or feeling undervalued, not feeling part of the hospice culture, emotional stress associated with volunteering, and burnout. And all these challenges really underscore the need for effective training and education and support, and the way in which volunteers are managed within that, the organisation of the hospice or hospice at home uh, care settings. I've been pleased to join the team from the University of Ulster to have a look at uh, where we might take the, this work. Um, there's over a thousand volunteers working with Northern Ireland Hospice, so we're, we're dealing with quite a resource, and to manage it more effectively, to understand the needs, I think we have a real opportunity here to draw our ideas together and to uh, address some of the issues uh, that uh, we see as the population ages. So I just want to finish off with uh, some conclusions from this initial piece of work. Um, you've heard that volunteers are a key part and there's benefits to the providers, um, the users and the volunteers themselves. But the evidence underpinning those different categories um, isn't very even. And I guess as academics, it's our job to identify the gaps and to try to uh, make, make sure that we make best use of the resource that's there. Uh, volunteering needs development in order to support the, uh, the needs of people at the end of life. Um, and it's uh, the, the, the job of the academics, I suppose, to identify the gaps and to work out how to address them. So the set of research questions here isn't r really completely formal, but it's just some, some ideas that seem to have emerged from the literature review. I exactly what training and support is needed for this role? Obviously, there's a number of roles, so the answer will depend on um, how, how the volunteers are going to work with uh, the 
the clients and in support of the organisation, how to involve volunteers in patient care, how to draw the line between what volunteers are able to do in terms of their ability to provide social support and what the professionals um, do. So there's some boundary analysis needed to help us understand that. How to avoid tensions that there might be between volunteers with the best will in the world and professionally qualified staff that are in the same area of work. Um, how to provide culturally sensitive care. I suppose volunteers probably bring some solutions as well as some potential issues there in that they generally will be part of the same social um, setup and part of the same culture, not usually. At least there's a potential there for some solutions as well as some issues to be addressed. Um, we'd, I'm not sure that we really understand the impact of volunteering on volunteers. We know that they can make a real contribution and it's um, a real benefit. Um, the impact of bereavement on volunteering, so if the volunteers are working in that setting and um, the disease follows its natural course, are, how, how are they supported through bereavement whenever um, it's, not their, it's not their own um, family member? They still need to be supported in that. So essentially, overall, how do we maximise the benefits from this opportunity whilst minimising the challenges? This, this picture is showing a, a path to indicate the idea of a sort of boundary space. Um, th this is, I guess, J Jan's thinking to, to help us understand the idea of a conceptual um, um, area, a conceptual gap between the professional services on one side and the family and the, um, the, the informal care that they some the volunteer work seems to be uh, seems to be important for for the volunteer to be able to navigate this space between the professional and the family in a in a way that um, pro provides support. So that's the kind of theoretical bit, I suppose. So uh, just to finish, then the wider role of of doing this kind of work in partnership. There's an opportunity, All Ireland, through the new Institute for Hospice and Palliative Care, to be able to take this forward, not, not just uh, locally, but um, across the island. Which that, that has some potential, because we have different ways of looking at things and different ways of organising healthcare that we can learn from those differences um, as well. So we've planned some future work now to take this forward. Um, it'll be pro probably relatively s small scale ev evaluation work because there already are volunteers involved with the various hospice organisations. Um, as I said, there was over a thousand with Northern Ireland Hospice. There's some number with Marie Curie as well, in hundreds. Um, people think of the, um, the fundraising that volunteers do. That's probably more than half. I mean, it is a substantial amount, but there is a lot of work goes on um, behind the scenes and I think we have a job to do to evaluate what is happening and make some comparisons um, with, the, with the different organisations to see how best to take things forward.